One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right, although he was mocked each and every time. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to americasnightmarewinter.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, go to americasnightmarewinter.com for this free report. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone. Welcome back to the Daniela Cambone Show here on Stansberry Research. And back with us, one of our all-time uh, most popular guests, David Morgan, publisher of The Morgan Report. Um, David, always good to see you. How are you doing, friend? I'm doing well under the conditions. Well said. Well, I think that gives us a good glimpse of, of everything we're going to talk on today. So, you know what? Let's just start with inflation and your thoughts on the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, I'm not sure if you agree that it's not so much an inflation act, but really a climate bill in disguise. But as we know, if you use the word inflation, that it will give the optics that you're actually doing something to fight inflation. Am I wrong with this analysis? No, I can add on slightly, Daniela. First of all, if you really think about it, almost all of these legislations, these bills that are passed, the executive orders, um, talking primarily in the United States, but it's really globally, these are misnomers. In other words, the Patriot Act is anything but patriotic. This Inflation Reduction Act is almost anything but addressing inflation. And another thing that most of us know, but I think bears repeating, is in most of these bills that are passed, there's all kinds of what they call writers. Writers are additional legislations that are enacted when the bill is passed. That's very little talked about. It's almost subterfuge. They sneak them in, so to speak. I mean, and most of the Congress critters don't even read the entire bill. But there's so much leverage in the propaganda press and the lobbyists that uh, most of these people are bought and paid for, as I've said in the past. And that's my firm, strong opinion. So it's going to maybe mitigate the propaganda press to look like the government's actually concerned and actually doing something. But as you said, it's really a watermelon, green on the outside, red on the inside, and it's really enacting more, turning the screws down on the populace at large. That's what it basically amounts to. And, and as you say, you know, the spin, you know, I was reading one headline from CNN opinion piece, the Inflation Reduction Act is a huge victory in this existential uh, fight. So uh, that's that's the spin on, uh, on 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 some of this. But let's talk about um, the the false calm that it's almost giving, right? Because you say the Federal Reserve has failed us. Less than one trillion was the total value of the Federal Reserve's assets in 08. To put that in perspective, you say in 2019 it was almost it was up to almost four trillion. In November 2021, it had grown to about nine trillion. As of this writing, it is over 12 trillion and growing fast. Yeah, well, we're going exponential, and that's something that most people don't understand. But once you go exponential, that's when you can get into hyperinflation. And if you go back to the beginning of the crisis, and I'm talking the current one, 2008, and Hank Paulson basically asked for the banks to uh, do what he told them to do. I think it was like a one sheet of paper and he basically forced them into it. And that was going to be it. And I forget the number. I think it was 800 million, somewhere in that, that area. And now, as you just said, Daniela, we're looking at 12 trillion. So obviously from 0.8 trillion or maybe 1 trillion to 12 times that amount in that time frame, 2008 to 2022, 
We are on a trajectory that does not end well. Uh, how does it how does it end, David? What what does it look like for you and how far out is it? Well, it's here. It's just that because it doesn't there's no real point of demarcation. I mean, the one I just outlined, you could say, well, that's the beginning of the end. But most things don't end abruptly. I mean, even, uh, you know, taking a bowling ball off the Empire State Building, it's a pretty quick trip. But there is, you know, the degrees as it accelerates to terminal velocity and then whacks into the earth. The point being is, as things slow down, they don't slow down for everybody at the same rate at the same time. So, but looking back in history, you're e it's easy to see that the contraction of the global economy is occurring and will continue for some time, and that globalization is basically a failure. You're seeing much more nationalis nationalism throughout all sectors. I mean, you see you know, Russia and China pulling away from uh, globalization. You see, uh, of course, the war in Ukraine, and a lot of... Nation states are thinking primarily how they can survive That's right. or what their specific needs are or what their productive capacity is and whether or not they want to sell it for dollars or Canadian dollars or Aussie dollars or euros or whatever. So people are looking after themselves more and more. So it's not going as more globalization. It's going as less. And this is the breakup. Now, the powers that be what they feed us constantly through the WEF and other outlets is that, you know, they are in charge and they have this grand plan and we're going to green energy and they've got all our problems solved and all we need is a new central bank digital currency and yada, yada, yada. But that's not what's going to take place. There's going to be large disruptions and they don't have as much power or control as they pretend that they have. Tell us more about what you think will take place. I'm just fascinated by this conversation. I mean, what will what will take place for you? Well, again, it depends where you are, you know, and what jurisdiction, what your culture is, what your societal norms are. But basically, there'll be some places that really aren't affected that much. As you know, when I made my main trip to China when I was in Beijing and spent quite some time there with the mining bureau and exploring different areas. Mm -hmm. The phrase that I caught and I kept with me from then on is the emperor is very far away, mm. meaning that when I got out of these mining districts mm. that uh, they didn't really pay too much attention to central authority. They basically did what they'd done for you know several decades. And of course, they had you know overseers, you might say. And that's the point is that as government becomes less reliable, less trusted and more invasive, mm -hmm. people start to ignore it more and more and go their own direction. And that's what you're seeing basically, again, globally. And so what happens is they start to organize a collective within their own groups, which can be at the city level, can be at the state level. Let's take the state level as a good example. There are states that in the U.S. are called red or blue. I hate the political debate, but that's a fact. So some states may just say, you know, you've gone too far, meaning you cannot enact this legislation, Mr. Federalist. We have states' rights, and we're going to ignore that. And that's already taken place. Mm -hmm. So that takes it from, you know, 50 states united under one, quote unquote, color of law, and brings it back to the state level. So maybe you're one out of 50 that says, we're not going to take it anymore. We don't want this. We don't need it. It's not legal. And we're ignoring it. And you take that from the state level into the county level and then the county level down further. So that's what I see, Danielle. Is it going to be everywhere and always? No, there'll be a lot of, you know, that go along to get along and think that the, you know, the authoritarian powers are worth listening to. But the vast majority that I can determine in the U.S., although you wouldn't know it from the propaganda press, but if you do your own research on independent actual numbers, you will see that uh, there's a vast majority, what's normally referred to as the quiet majority or the silent majority, that have their own independent thinking and more self-reliant than uh, you would believe based on what you see on the common everyday news. So, so what's your concern there, though, that there'd be tremendous uprisings if everyone's just kind of decides to do their own thing? What's your worry? 
Well, my worry is basic needs. I mean, my worry is what's going to happen to the cost of oil, what's going to happen to the food supply, what's going to happen as inflation gets into a wage price spiral, where let's say big corporations are more or less forced to increase the wages so people can afford to buy their gasoline and their groceries. And then that pushes the gas and groceries further, higher, which means they put in more price or wage demands. And that spiral continues. That's one worry of mine. Another worry is just the, uh, the human nature being reluctant for change. You know, when you're used to getting your weekly paycheck or your biweekly paycheck and it's worth this much and it buys this much, and now you go to your grocer and that product doesn't exist anymore or it's on back order. So all these disruptions are very upsetting to human nature. They want constants. They want mm-hmm. reliability. They want their faith to be, you know, uh, founded and, you know, the next tomorrow is going to be the same as today. So my concern is not so much that we can't get through it. This has happened throughout history. But my concern is what will people do or what will their reactions be? In some cases, they'll shrug it off and march on. In other cases, they'll scream for more government intervention, that you've got to give us more free stuff, or you've got to take care of this particular group, or our feelings are hurt, we need this. So it's going to basically bifurcate society, and I'm not talking just the U.S. alone, into basically two groups. Those that need Big Daddy to take care of them, and those that say, I don't need Big Daddy to take care of me, I'm an adult. Well said, David. And I guess this makes me uh, think of a recent article I read on the Morgan Report by uh, one of your contributors, uh, and, you know, entitled Close Your Eyes, Go to Sleep, Everything is Fine. This is what they want us to believe. And in it, the, uh, the article outlines seven disturbing trends. Now, I'm not going to go through each trend. I invite the folks to, to read the article on their own. But one I want to hone in on is that U.S. monetary policymakers are denying or redefining simple terms like recession and inflation. I want to talk more about this. What is meant here? Well, it's pure Orwellian doublespeak. I mean, anyone that's ever read or watched or studied 1984 knows that, you know, war is peace and freedom is slavery. These are words that in the book talk about how words were convoluted and basically meant the opposite of what they had originally meant. And so John was just pointing it out to the reader that we can redefine whatever we want. And this is total dictatorial, totalitarian rhetoric that we know you don't, you believe us. And if you don't believe us, your social credit score is going to go down if you speak out against it. And of course, this is the, you know, this is as anti-freedom as you can get. And of course, the whole point of not only the monetary system or sound money from my studied perspective, But the whole human experience is about being free. And if you are not free, then are you really yourself or do you have the ability to really express yourself in total? And the answer is no. And that's basically idealistic. I mean, you can be, quote unquote, free and still belong to a group or look for a mentor. You know, very few people, you know, blaze their own trail. There's very few pioneers. There's a lot of frontiersmen that will go behind the people that blaze the trail, but there mm-hmm. aren't many true leaders. I'm off track, Daniela, but my point is that we've got to understand we are in the matrix. We are in the Orwellian society. Everything that you see, you should actually immediately think the opposite of if it comes from the mainstream press. If they say it's a Patriot Act, think it's an unpatriot act. If they say it's inflation reduction, think it's inflation acceleration. This is how you have to start. And there are many of us that do that. And there are many that do not even understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, that's like a whole other topic, because I would love to get into like, how do you, you know, we could maybe touch on it here. It's like, how do you protect yourself in this matrix, matrix like environment? I know you've spoken about gold and silver. But one thing I want to bring up are your thoughts on on crypto. Uh, because I know in one of your other articles, you ask, why are you still putting your faith in cryptos? Um, you were speaking, obviously, to the, the trillion dollars that was wiped out of the market with, you know, we saw the, the crash of Luna and Celsius and whatnot. Um, 
you know, why, why, why can't you embrace um, a notion like Bitcoin? Because I would think, you know, you as a pioneer of freedom, of, you know, getting outside of the system, would, would embrace such a thought concept. Yeah, that's a great question. And thanks for bringing it up. First of all, I'm not anti-crypto and I'm for the blockchain. And Bitcoin specifically, if you go to my crypto conspiracy series on my blog and look at um, interview number 14, you'll see how much I agree with the basics Satoshi Nakamoto's premise on what Bitcoin was started as. And it's been morphed into basically a payment or a currency or a coin, whereas really it was a transaction process. It was a software to basically eliminate the middleman and have total transparency and be fair to both sides without any banker or broker in between. But it's been morphed again into something different than that. So one, I don't like that idea. I like the basic start and um, you know, I have no control over how it's been morphed or tweaked. But if you go back to my first article I wrote in the public domain, it still exists my two bits about Bitcoin. I say that in, that in that article, we will see if it really gains traction, you'll see the authorities come in and start to regulate it. And that's what we've seen all throughout across the board. So I think the concept of uh, independent money is great. I'm more for specie money or commodity backed money. But in theory and in practice, you can have your own uh, agreement because money is several things, and I don't want to get into the theory of money. I have books back there, talk, whole books about the theory of money. But either it's really something of substance, like gold or silver, or it's a contract. And the contract is, you know, the Ithaca dollars, I brought that up in other interviews, is just really a piece of paper issued by the local community, and they all agree. And the agreement is that an hour's labor is worth this piece of paper, and you can trade that piece of paper for a unit of labor for someone else. And so you can have just a contractual agreement and use it as money, a medium of exchange, even a store of value if you don't you know, inflate it. So there's lots of answers to your question, but I, I think that outlined it fairly well. While we're on the topic of optics, uh, something else I want to bring up are your thoughts on the U.S. dollar. You say, quote, while the news says the dollar is going up, we know the real story. The purchasing value of that dollar has been in a steep decline. Rent, food, gas, cars, real estate have all gone through the roof. You say we've been deceived into thinking our fiat system is fine. What do you mean by that? Well, again, optics. So it's, I'll try to give an analogy. This is off the top of my head. But, you know, if you're racing a Volkswagen and you have a Ford Mustang, you can just, you know, blow the doors off of it, you know, on a street race. But, and so then you measure everything on that one race, you know, so look at that. So the dollar is strong against all the other contenders. But if you look at the reality of something like stood the test of time like gold, which might be something like uh, oh, a, a Lamborghini, and it gets in a race, it's just gonna blow the doors off that Mustang. But that's something that no one really sees, talks about, or, very, or is very knowledgeable about. They all know the Lamborghini's there, but they don't see it in action. And that's sort of my analogy, is that you see real money will usurp fake money. But as I've said again many times, we trust what we trust. And most people have taught to believe okay. or have faith in paper money. And they will more and more. As the stock market goes down, the bond market crashes, the corporate zombie banks or zombie corporations uh, blow away, the, the faith will be in that piece of paper. And more or less rightfully so. But as that starts to drift away because of 9% inflation and food scarcity and rent increases and oil prices, that is when you get that psychological shift that moves into something of real substance. And that's in the past always been the precious metals. So, so let, me, let me see if I got that. So because this is the number one question I'm, I'm sure you hear, right? Um, if it, with inflation, you know where it's at. Why aren't gold prices higher? And then we always hear the response. Well, it's the strength of the U.S. dollar. But you're saying a, it's not, it's not a real strength, and b, it's just because investors are not seeing that gold is there as an option. Is it that lack of interest in gold that's missing? Primarily, if you go back to the first bull market, and as you know, I was old enough to be in it. You had, and no one knows these numbers for sure. 
but you had somewhere around 1% or two. Well, it depends who you read, but maybe two or 3% waiting for most investors into the precious metals. And now it's about 1% or half a percent. So the idea is that if we just go back to what took place in the 1970s, that would triple the demand for gold and silver. And this would take these prices in paper terms far, far higher. And I believe that's ahead of us. Okay, well, that, that echoes a lot of conversations I've been having with some experts on the sidelines that, you know, the moment that money does start flowing into gold, that's, that's when we really see uh, a quite a remarkable rally in the metal. Um, on the topic of silver, I'm interested to get your thoughts. You've spoken and written at nauseum about how silver is crucial uh, to our society. Uh, we need it in everything. And I know you get asked this all the time of why it's not moving higher. Uh, but what's, um, what's, what's going on with silver here, David? Well, <laughs> it's undervalued. It's undervalued relative to gold. And there is enough silver at the margin to keep these prices where they are. I mean, even though everyone talks about how much suppression there is in the futures market, and that's true, but at the margin, meaning when you have to take physical silver off of either the exchange or refinery or directly from a mine, that demand is being met for the most part, which is the only way you can keep the paper price where it is. However, we're starting to see cracks in the system, and mm -hmm. that is because these sovereign mints are not producing the amount of coinage that the demand requires. In fact, the U.S. Mint is the primary example. The United States Mint's mandate is to produce as many silver eagles as the market demands, and yet the market demands a lot more than they're producing, and that means the premium has gone sky high. I mean, it's like $14 in some instances. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a that's a subtle clue that something's not right in the silver market. Another one that goes completely conspiracy theory. So I'll don my tin foil hat, but that's a semiconductor industry. The semiconductor industry uses 44 million ounces of silver per year. Now I'm not saying the shortage in semiconductors is because of lack of silver availability, but I'm not saying the opposite either. And, and interesting, I was going to say I had you know, seeing the premiums on silver re products recently. And I was like, wow. So obviously demand is there. Like you said, it shows that there's something um, seriously wonky going on. Um, so interesting. Um, finally, uh, David, just to wrap our conversation here, um, final thoughts for, for investors and our audience watching. I know you s started off the segment by saying, you know, uh, you were okay given the current circumstances. Um, you know, what just some closing remarks here from you? Well, thank you for having me on the show. I am of the idea of balance. I think that you don't need to be weighted too heavily in the precious metals. There's probably still opportunities in the stock markets. I've never been that favorable to bonds, but in some cases they probably apply. I think one of the best places to be in this type of an environment are you know, needs, needs would be like ADM. I recommended ADM at, at 35. One of my members in the, in the private group or premium service asked me, I want to hedge food. You keep talking about food. And this was well before it became uh, something that was talked about daily. I said, well, ADM. And it went down. It went from 35, I forget where, but now I think it's at 75. And like utilities, I mean, utilities aren't going away. One of the best utilities you can ever get is a water investment. And these are things that are very often not even spoken about. And those would be, you know, good investments. Uh, one of my readers, again, has asked me to kind of look at alternatives to the precious metals. And I don't have time to follow them in, in, in depth, but I have enough time to ferret out which ones are the best in that type of sector. So food, energy, water, that type of thing. And I think self-reliance, you know, looking to get a handout is not the attitude that we have for a free society, no matter what jurisdiction you're in or what the ideology is of your authoritarian figures. It's more freedom demands responsibility. And you have to be responsible for your own decisions. And that's something that I think has been lost on some parts of society, that they are not responsible, that they are a victim, that circumstances are against them. 
But the only thing we really can, there's very few things as humans we can control, but one of them is our attitude. And our attitude has to be that you have the ability to do X. You have the ability to find a different job if you hate the one you're in. You have the ability to save more if you cut back on this or that. I mean, there's a lot of things that people don't empower themselves because they're, th they're taught from the time we start in the public schooling system that you need to depend on someone else, not on yourself, where really the way to true, true wealth, I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about individual freedom, starts with the individual being empowered and empowered not only through their own efforts, but by those of others around them that understand that there's nothing, nothing more powerful than the truth or as powerful as a true free individual. Unfortunately, as a society at large, we've lost that. Wow. Uh, beautifully said, David. I cannot add more to that. That sums it up perfectly and brilliantly. As always, I want to thank you so much for your time and for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure having you. Thank you. And I hope to see you in person soon, David. Um, yeah, me too. On that note, thank you all for watching this edition of the Daniela Comboni Show on Stansbury Research. We will have much more for you coming your way always, but be sure to sign up at DanielaComboni.com to stay on top of all these incredible interviews. Thank you all for watching. That's it for me. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.